the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Good to be in God's house today and thank you for bringing a copy of the Word of God. We're going to look along together in several passages this morning uh, when we just simply talk about the privileges uh, of prayer. The privilege of prayer. Somebody said that there's nothing beyond the reach of prayer except that which lies beyond the will of God. I'm, I'm firmly convinced that that's true. Prayer can do anything because God can do anything. I think one of the things that's going to happen when we get into heaven is uh, we're, we're going to see all that God did through prayer. And then one of the other things I think we're going to see is we're going to see all the things that God wanted to do, but we didn't ask him for it. And we didn't pray and didn't seek the Lord about it. I, I guess one of the earliest memories that I have in my life, matter of fact, uh, I can't remember anything earlier than when my Aunt Bertha would pat me on the head and she would say, Mikey, God's got something awesome for you. God's got something good for you. She didn't use the word awesome. That was before awesome ever got here. But <clears throat> God's got something good for you. And then day after day, uh, she would be on her knees beside the couch and she'd be crying out to God, tears rolling down her cheeks and crying out to God. And a lot of those prayers involved uh, me and my name. John Wesley said God does everything by prayer, but nothing without it. Um, Jeremiah 33.3 3 was just kind of laid on my heart this week and I actually um, texted it to one of my grandchildren and it just simply said, call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things that you don't know about. Call unto me, pray, seek my face. I, I think it's incredible to think for just a minute that somebody's praying for me. I, I love to get the cards and the emails and the text messages from people all week long. I'm praying for you. Uh, that means a lot to me. I think about when Moses was talking to God and, and praying unto God. You know, Aaron had, had pulled a, a stupid and while Moses was gone, he led the people to fashion a golden calf and they worshiped it. And uh, so Aaron got on God's hit list and God's just going to wipe him out. And uh, Moses went to God on Aaron's behalf and said, God, I wish you wouldn't do that. I, I ask you not to do that. And, and God changed his mind and wrath did not fall on Aaron. I, I think about Hannah um, and her prayer. You know, she was childless and she went before God. She said, God, I, I'd love to have a baby. And if you, if you give me a baby, I'll give him back to you. And we have the prophet Samuel as a result of that prayer. I think about Nehemiah when the walls uh, of, of Jerusalem were just flattened out and it was a reproach unto God. Nehemiah went to God, God, I, I, I want to lead uh, an effort to rebuild these walls, but I, I need material, I need stuff to make it happen. And God softened a king's heart to support Nehemiah to come along and rebuild those walls. One of the neatest prayers I, I think has got some humor behind it is when Simon Peter was locked up in jail and the disciples got to praying. You remember the story? And, and, and God set him free and so he goes back to join the disciples and he's standing out the door knocking on the door wanting to get in and the disciples said shut up we're, we're praying for Simon Peter he's in jail we need to get him out. Uh, so that you know, there, there's a lot of power behind prayer. You and I we get into a tough situation and what do we do? We, we turn to God, we call on God and we know by turning to God because he is the greatest resource at our disposal. But the problem is this, and, and I think if you were honest, you'd agree with me about it. Most of the time prayer is our last resort rather than our first response. We're just guilty of that. I heard about two little boys. Uh, they were 
talking one day, and one of them was a Sunday school kid, and the other one was not a Sunday school kid. And the Sunday school kid said, uh, I know something you don't know. The other kid said, well, what's that? He said, I know the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the kid who didn't go to Sunday school said, I know the Lord's Prayer too. He said, oh, you don't know the Lord's Prayer? He said, yes, I do too. Well, if you know the Lord's Prayer, what is it? The little boy said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. And that little boy looked back at him and said, well, you do know the Lord's Prayer, don't you? <laughs> now, the fact of the matter is, we're not as astute about prayer as we think that we are. Um, I want you to take your Bible, look with me to 1 Peter, if you will, chapter number 4 and verse number 7. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 7. The Bible says, but the end of all things is at hand. I, I think you would agree with me that we are living in the last days. He says, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. God desires to hear from us. God wants us to talk to him. But it's one of the most overlooked and underused resources that you and I have in our life. I, I think about the incredible tools of communication that are at our disposal right now. Uh, we have the internet. We have uh, social media. Uh, we have text messages. We have emails powerful tools of communication but the fact of the matter is the most powerful tool of communication that is at our disposal is prayer it's the most available that we have the bible says we are to pray at all times it's the most affordable resource that we have the bible tells us that we believe that God will hear and that he will answer our prayer. It's the most applicable resource that we have because the Bible tells us that in everything by prayer and supplication, we're to make our wishes known unto God. But yet at the same time, not only is uh, it affordable and applicable and available, it is also the most assaulted resource of communication that we have today. The Bible, the Bible doesn't tell us, but somebody said, and I believe it to be true, is that Satan trembles when he sees the weakest of all Christians down on their knees. Someone said this, that prayer without question is the highest activity of the human soul. Man is at his greatest and highest. When he is on his knees, he comes face to face with God. J. Oswald Sanders says, no spiritual exercise is such a blending of complexity and simplicity. It is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try, yet the sublime streams that reach the majesty on high. It invests puny man with the source of omnipotence. Now, when I use the term prayer, uh, be careful that you don't get an image of a particular posture that you have to be in when you use prayer. We were all taught when we were growing up that we had to close our eyes and bow our heads and, or, or that we had to get down on our knees. It's really not about a particular posture, nor is it about circumstance. So look, look with me, if you will, at Colossians chapter 4 and uh, verse number 3. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul saying to the church at Colossae, he said, with all praying also for us, that God would open us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I also am in bonds. He's talking about the matter in that beginning of that verse. He's talking about having a powerful devotion to pray, to seek God. And to call on God. God wants us to pray. And it's simply just a matter of doing. It's a, it's a matter of devotion. When you study the New Testament, you'll discover that the term devotion appears about 11 times in the New Testament. And six of those times have to do with the matter of prayer. So uh, without doubt, God is telling us that we need to be devoted to this matter of prayer. But have you noticed something with me? that it is probably, if not the most, one of the most difficult disciplines of the Christian life. It is challenging at best. 
It is so many distractions that come with it. Now, I want to give you this morning, very quickly, I want to give you four privileges that are involved in prayer. I hope you'll write them down. You ready? First of all, it is the privilege of insight. The privilege of insight. Look with me, if you will, at the book of James, chapter number one. Just a few pages toward the book of Revelation, right after the book of Hebrews. James chapter one and verse five. The Bible begins by, if any of you lack wisdom, can I get a amen there? That's us. Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally or generously, and he does not withhold it, and it shall be given to him. You understand, we serve a generous God, and in the midst of that generosity, he wants to give us discernment. He wants to give us insight. Uh, I heard about a pilot who got on the uh, radio to speak to the passengers back and he said guys I got good news and I got bad news he says the bad news is is that we have lost all of our instrumentation uh, we don't know uh, which direction that we're going uh, nor what the destination might be but I've got good news for you uh, we just picked up a good strong tailwind and we're making good time well that's the way that you and I sometimes are in our life we oftentimes get in the midst of the dark, but the problem is we get accustomed to being in the dark and we might have even made statements like, you know, I've tried to pray, but nothing seems to happen when I pray and so I just try something else. Now let me give you three things that uh, the privilege of prayer will give you insight about. Number one, he will give you wisdom for your trials. If any of you lack wisdom. Now, verse 5 is in the context of going through trials and difficulties and tribulations uh, in your life and major questions begin to arise uh, about why you are in those trials and difficulties and bumps and bruises. By the way, let me just parenthetically tell you that if you're going through some of that stuff right now, God either allowed it or he caused it. And what he wants to do is he wants you to get to the point like I have to do oftentimes to bring back to my memory that I am to count it all joy when I am in the midst of all of that because God says that the testing of our faith will produce endurance. But what do we do? We go kicking and screaming, get me out of this mess, get me out of this difficulty. I want loose of all of this. So then in verse 5, he says, if any of you lack wisdom. So what is he saying here? He says, ask of me. Here's one of the beautiful things about trials and tribulations. They drive us to a dependence uh, on God. So we go to God in prayer and we seek him. Now sometimes God does not answer. Sometimes he just allows us to go through those trials and difficulties and circumstances so that it produces whatever it is that he's trying to produce in our life. In Psalm 86, 7, the Bible says, in the day of my trouble, I will call on you. In 2 Samuel 22, in verse 7, uh, David says, in my distress, I called on the Lord and I cried to my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple. And my cry did enter into his ears. I think about Jesus' own teaching uh, in prayer. And he taught his disciples. He, he said, deliver us from evil. So in this insight, this privilege uh, is to gain wisdom for our trials. But notice what else. It, it's an insight for our testimony. Uh, back in Colossians chapter 4, in that third verse that we just read a few minutes ago, uh, he's saying, uh, God, God I, I need a word from you. Would you please open up a door so that the testimony of your word could go forth through that door? And he wants to make it clear in how we are to speak. How many of us have gotten into a situation 
um, in talking to somebody about the Lord and the opportunity to share our faith and to share our witness and, and we just draw a blank and we really don't know what to say. Well, Paul's prayer in Colossians 4 was, God, now that you've given me this door of opportunity, I, I need to be able to share the mystery of faith with these people so make it clear and plain and unmistakable to me what it is that I am to say. How many of you have been in that kind of situation when you had an opportunity, but you just didn't know what to say? Prayer opens that door for you, and God answers, and he will give you what you ought to say. But then there is the insight in your thinking, in your thinking. So we get to a place in our life oftentimes, and we don't know what to do. We don't know which way to go. We, we're saying, God, should I take that job over here? Should I move my family over here or over there? Uh, God, what should I do? And how many of you have been in situations when you really needed God to intervene and tell you and give you guidance into the journey in this life? How many of you raise your hand? I, I need, I've been in those situations uh, before. Look, look in your Bible to Philippians chapter 1. And I want you to see verse number 9, if you will. Y'all, you really ought to underline this. You ought to highlight it. You ought to draw some attention to it. As a matter of fact, I think it would probably be a good prayer to pray every day of your life. Look at verse 9 of chapter 1. Paul says, In this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. God, there are times that I need to know which way to go, what to do, what to say. I need to know uh, w what direction that I am to go in here. And so I'm praying, God, you give me the right answers. Give me the judgment that I need, the discernment that I need uh, to make this happen. Now, let me give you number two. You ready for this? Not only the, the, the privilege of insight, but the privilege of intimacy. The privilege of intimacy. In Psalm 145 and verse 18, the Bible says the Lord is near all of them that call on him, that call on him in truth. Powerful word. That's intimacy. That's personal. Let, let, let me share some with you. Do, you. do you really want to know God? Do you want to know God? Then you spend time in the word of God and you spend time in prayer. God, I want to know you. I want to have that intimate, personal relationship with you. And here's the thing that just absolutely boggled my mind. The very first time that I became acquainted with it and God revealed it to me. God loves me specifically. Out of over the 7 billion people on the face of the earth... You feel like sometimes that you're just a little grain of sand in the midst of seven billion people on the face of the earth. But the fact of the matter, listen, listen, God loves you specifically and uniquely. Out of all of the people, he loves you. Romans chapter 8 and also Galatians chapter 6 and verses 6, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible says, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of the son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba Father. That'd be really weird for me to go down to Bob and say, hey daddy. Wouldn't that be a little bit weird to you? I mean, I'd go to you in, in somewhere in the congregation and call you out. and Hey, hey dad. But listen. God's made it possible through an intimate, personal relationship with him that we can cry out, Daddy, to the God of this universe through prayer and through the study of his word. You understand, it is a powerful attribute. Now, let me just stop here for a minute and just talk personally with you for something that I do and have been doing for the last 30 years. And it's old and you've probably been taught this and it's just redundant to you, but maybe you need the reminder. When I pray, I use an acronym called ACTS, A-C-T-S. And I go by that acronym every time that I go before God. 
And the acronym is, is, is powerfully representative. The A stands for adoration. So that when I begin to pray, the first thing that I want to do is that I want to adore him. I, I want to tell him who I think he is in my life and in the lives of all of his people. And, and so one of the best things that you can do is pray back to God what the word of God says about God. And if you just study the names of God and just present that back to him, you, you got about 18 attributes just through the names of the Lord. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. You are Jehovah Shalom. You are my peace. You are Jehovah Sidkenu. You are my righteousness. And, and you understand God is pleased when we pray back to him what he has recorded in his word. So I begin my prayer just simply adoring the Lord. I did something this week uh, that I challenge you, maybe go do this on your own. Go to Psalm 18, take a pen and paper and just sit down and write out every attribute in Psalm 18 that you see that is recorded of God. And let that be a blessing to you and a tool in your prayer time. Now the C stands for confession. Confession. That, that, that's a powerful thing. Now hear my heart a minute. I, I've, got, I've got two or three very close, intimate friends in my life. And I feel like that I can go to them and talk to them about anything. And have and do. Talk to them about anything. But, but I can't do that with somebody that I don't have a trust relationship with. I can't do that with a stranger. I, I can't do that with just somebody that I have a casual acquaintance with. It has to be somebody that I am intimately involved with that I can pour my heart out about the very deepest recesses of my heart and, and share that with them. So when I confess, I am confessing to somebody that I am intimately involved with in the Lord. In, in, in Proverbs chapter 28, the Bible says, if, if you conceal your sin, you will not prosper. But if you confess and forsake your sin, you will find compassion. And so in the midst of the confession, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is to be very specific. Somebody said, and I believe it to be true, what we like to do is we like to sin retail and we like to confess wholesale. And we want to take all of our sin and we want to lump it up into one big old lump and we want to say, God, forgive me of my sin when we have committed them specifically. But we want to confess them generally. So when you go before God and say, you know, God, I, I said something over there that I shouldn't have said. God says, no, you lied. So we need to be specific in our confession time. Now, let me give you the T. And it simply stands for thanksgiving. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18, the Bible says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. I saw something this, uh, this week. I, I don't, don't know that I'd ever paid that much attention to. Read it many, many times before. But in Romans 1, 12, the Bible says that the wrath of God fell on people because they failed to give thanks. So, so we thank God. But let me, let me hurry. Let me go on. And the S stands for supplication. We, uh, we just finished studying Hebrews chapter 4. And uh, verse, verse 16, but I, I will read it again. It says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find grace, uh, especially in our time of need. Now, because you have adored the Lord, because you have confessed your sins, because you have thanked him for what he has already done, now all of a sudden, you can go into the Holy of Holies, you can approach the throne of grace, not cowering down, but you can go in now with great boldness to begin to make petition unto God about the needs that you face in your life. 
So that's your, your, your prayer formula. May I say to you with all of my heart, there's absolutely nothing too big that God can't handle and there is nothing too small that he's not interested in. Everything about your life. Then there is the privilege of intercession. Number three, the privilege of intercession. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege that God has allowed us to come to him on behalf of somebody else. All of us have somebody in our life that's been praying for us. Every one of us in this room. And maybe uh, you've been praying for others. But it just doesn't appear that God is doing anything. But the fact is, God wants us just to keep persevering in prayer until his timing that he then begins to move. In 1 Samuel 12, here it says, listen to this. Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Do you know it's a sin not to pray for other people? According to scriptures. There, there are two kinds of intercession. There is the vertical intercession where the triune God is interceding on behalf of us. You, you understand that there are times when we don't know how to pray, what to pray, and we're blowing it in our prayer, that the Holy Spirit of God goes to the Father on our behalf with groanings and utterings that we don't even know about and cannot understand. And he makes it perfect in the ears of the Father. Then the Bible says that the Son of God has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God and he ever liveth to make intercession for us. There is the vertical aspect of intercessory prayer. Then there is the horizontal intercession that we're called on to pray for lost people. We're called on to pray for our family. We're called on to pray for our friends. We're called on to pray for those who are in authority over us. It was something that I saw this week that absolutely boggled my mind and I read it and I read that story over and over and over again. Matter of fact, I, it was one of the classes that I took when I was uh, working on my undergraduate degree. And, and you remember Job lost everything, right? You remember? I mean, he lost everything but his wife. And he had three crazy friends who kept bombarding him by saying, man, if you just confess the sin out of your life, then, then you wouldn't be facing all that you're facing. But if you look at Job 42, there's a little phrase in there that will absolutely stagger you. He said, and God restored all of his fortune when he prayed for his friends. Instead of getting angry, instead of getting bitter, instead of having unforgiveness in his heart for these three guys, knowing that he was right with God, knowing that he was not, not harboring sin in his life, and these three, he didn't let bitterness and unforgiveness toward them rob him. The Bible says that he prayed for his friends, and when he prayed for his friends, God restored everything in his midst. Wow, we're commanded to pray. Now, let me give you the last one. It's the privilege of impact. The privilege of impact. Go back to James 5 with me for a minute in verse number 16. J James chapter 5, and I want you to see verse 16 with me a minute. Uh, you could quote it, I could quote it, uh, but I want you to read it and just see it and, and, and hear it at the same time. Here we go. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man will accomplish a lot of stuff. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man will cause a lot of impact. So, so there it is. How many of you sitting here and how many of you uh, watching live stream this morning or see this on television in a couple of weeks, how many of you would agree with me that God answers prayer and changes stuff? Would you agree with me that God changes things through prayer? Let, let, me, let me share with you something pretty bold. If you're saved today, 
probably you're saved because somebody prayed for you and lifted you up. And if you're walking in victory right now with Christ, in all probability, you're walking in victory because somebody prayed for you. I, um, anybody in here, I, I, I should have brought it. I just forgot to bring it with me. Uh, I, I forgot it at 8 o'clock. I forgot it again at 9.30. Anybody in here have their 8 to 15 card uh, maybe in your Bible and you brought it with you today? You got your 8 to 15 card? Anybody in the building? So it's, you got yours? Would you just hold it up right there? I would come get it, but just hold it up right there. He's got his 8 to 15 card. Um, you know, we, we started this prayer card back in January. Remember? How many of you remember? Just tell me, your, tell me you remember. You got your 8 to 15 card, all right? Our deacons and staff got it long before Christmas. This past Tuesday, in our regular deacons meeting, one of the young deacons who filled out his prayer card and wrote his daddy's name down in the prayer card. His daddy was gloriously and dramatically saved this past Monday night. I filled out my prayer card. I put it in my study. I see it the very, when I sit down and look at my computer, there is my prayer card. It, it, it's phenomenal. The power of prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, had eight, eight distinct answers to prayer just since January. God answers prayer. God moves in response to our prayer time. I, I wonder where Dale Earnhardt Jr. would be this morning had somebody not been praying for him this week. I got this from a preacher, don't know who, don't remember where. But it says this, if the request is wrong, God says no. If timing is wrong, God says slow. If you are wrong, God says grow. But if the request is right, the timing is right, and you are right, then go. Many times we say, God, I, I want you to move, I want you to speak, and, and yet seemingly nothing happens. We go before God and we say, God, now I'm in conformance to Matthew 21. And God, without a doubt, I have understood what the word says in James chapter one. And God, as best as I know, the principle of John 14 is applicable to my life right now. And yet nothing is happening. God says you need to do a checkup from the neck up. You gotta make sure that what you are asking is in conformity to my will for this particular situation and time. You gotta make sure that you understand that your ways are not my ways and your time is not my time. And you gotta make sure that there is nothing in your life personally that is hindering me from answering this prayer. Because ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of indications in the word of God that we have things in our life that keep God from answering prayer. Let me give you a few of them as I close. I won't give you the scripture reference right now, but understand that if this is selfishness, God is not going to answer. If we have wrong motives behind us, God is not going to answer. If there is unconfessed sin in our life, God is not going to answer. If, by the way, if you're treating your spouse wrong, God's not going to answer. If you have an unforgiving spirit, if there's unbelief in your heart, if you've not met the needs of others, and here's the biggie, I haven't answered because you haven't asked. You have not because you ask not. Let, let me give you a little formula. You ready? Here we go. Number one, stay awake. Y'all don't look at me. I, I, hey, huh? The other is stay alert. I don't know how many people have come to me just in the last week or two and have talked to me about their prayer time and, and said, Pastor, I just can't stay focused. Hey, I get that. We all face that. There's not a person in this room that in the midst of praying uh, that doesn't have a difficult time staying focused in their prayer time. Some sound 
will occur and it'll, it'll, it'll get your attention. Your mind will get to wandering off in the midst of the prayer. And you, mm, I got to get it back right here. You'll smell food and you'll get hungry. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? Stay effective. Make sure that the channel is cleaned up and like it ought to be. Prayer is a privilege. We have the privilege of insight where God gives us a discernment. We have the privilege of intimacy that we get to know the Heavenly Father. We have the privilege of intercession and that is to praying to God on behalf of somebody else in behalf of the needs of our life. And then we have the privilege of impact. Oh, what a powerful privilege it is to know that there's a lot of influence in the midst of praying. But I love this next one. I love what I'm about to say. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Matter of prayer. Some of you here this morning and you don't know Jesus. You've never met him. You've never received the forgiveness of sin. If you were to die today, you'd spend eternity in hell. There may be many that are on live stream this morning. You don't have the confident assurance that when you die, that you're going to go to heaven. Somebody may be watching by television. And you were just channel surfing and stopped on this and heard the gospel for a few minutes. But you've never called on the name of the Lord and you've never been saved. Wherever you might be, whether here in this auditorium or at home, God will hear your prayer. If you'll call out to him, repent of your sins, receive him into your heart, he says he will save you. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege today of being here and just uh, taking your word for a few minutes and maybe encouraging somebody. Lord, it's been an encouragement to me. I pray, Father, that if there's somebody here that's lost and does not know Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior, today they might turn away from sin and by faith place their faith and their trust in you. Receive you into their heart and their life. Be changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray for all of us in this room whose prayer life might be anemic, maybe really non-existent. May today be the day, God, that you open the eyes of all of us to show us how important prayer really is. How that you change things through prayer. God, you know... Uh, you know the desire of my heart. You know the overwhelming prayer that I've been seeking you about. The need. God, I pray in the name of Jesus today that you would change that heart and save that soul that's nearest to my heart. Father, I, I pray for a renewal of prayer among us that we might be known as a church that prays. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.